Welcome back, Mitochondria. This is Dr. Pivler for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. Today, we're going to be talking about another very exciting topic in the world of mitochondrial dynamics, and that is mitochondrial biogenesis. Have you ever wondered how mitochondria replicate themselves and regenerate themselves? Well, we've talked about half of the equation so far. We've talked about mitophagy, mitochondrial specific autophagy, which is the recycling of damaged mitochondria. But today, we're going to be talking about how new mitochondria are actually formed to produce new healthy, vibrant, and functional mitochondria. And it's going to be important for overall health. It's also going to be important for the reversal of mitochondrial heteroplasmy, which is another exciting topic. So let's get into this. So we're gonna go into some basic definitions of what mitochondrial biogenesis actually is. So in response to energy demand triggered by developmental signals and environmental stressors, the cells launch the mitochondrial biogenesis process. This is a self-renewal route by which new mitochondria are generated from ones already existing. And as it states here, the transcriptional co-activator peroxisome proliferator activator receptor gamma co-activator 1-alpha that's a mouthful, also known as PGC1-alpha, has been characterized as a major factor in the transcriptional control of several mitochondrial components. Thus, PGC1-alpha is often described as a master regulator of mitochondrial biogenesis, as well as a central player in regulating the antioxidant defense. However, accumulating evidence suggests that PGC1-alpha is also involved in the complex regulation of mitochondrial quality beyond biogenesis, which includes mitochondrial network dynamics and autophagic removal of damaged mitochondria. In addition, mitochondrial reactive oxygen species production has been suggested to regulate skeletal muscle insulin sensitivity, which may be influenced by PGC1-alpha. This review aims to highlight the current evidence for PGC1-alpha-mediated regulation of skeletal muscle mitochondrial function beyond the effects of mitochondrial biogenesis, as well as the potential PGC1-alpha-related impact on insulin-stimulated glucose uptake into skeletal muscle. Novelty, PGC1-alpha regulates mitochondrial biogenesis, but also affects the mitochondrial functions beyond biogenesis. Mitochondrial quality mechanisms including fission, fusion, and mitophagy are regulated by PGC1-alpha. PGC1-alpha mediates regulation of mitochondrial quality may affect age-related mitochondrial dysfunction and insulin sensitivity. So as we can see, the PGC1-alpha co-activator is important for at minimum mitochondrial biogenesis or the creation of new healthy vibrant mitochondria. However, recent studies have shown that it has several other positions and jobs and we're going to go over those in this video. So as we're going to see, PGC1 alpha is responsible for several different gene products that affect mitochondrial function. And it is affected by several different protein pathways that are regulated by various cellular conditions. If you remember right, during the inducible factor videos and other videos relating to hypoxia and pseudohypoxia, you see that that pseudohypoxic state was, in addition to true hypoxia, caused by several deficiencies and energy states in the cell that is seen when there is excess, excess glucose intake, excess caloric intake, which the body cannot handle effectively. So, for example, we saw back in those videos that when NADH was high, under a high glucose state, we we saw that CERT1 was actually blocked and that led to a pseudohypoxia and ultimately activation of HIF1-alpha. When we saw that ATP was grossly higher than AMP, that would also, through the downregulation of AMPK, cause a pseudohypoxic state. Other factors would be cyclic AMP and excess oxidative stress. It's notable here that when oxidative stress is in excess, it can activate HIF1-alpha, but when it's in its normal signaling function and normal amounts, it can signal to the nucleus to PGC1-alpha to increase mitochondrial biogenesis and, as you'll see, several other jobs which feed back on that ROS, such as the antioxidant response elements in RF1 and 2. This is just another representation of the same slide, essentially. You see that there, when there's elevated NAD relative to NADH, when there's relative elevation of AMP over ATP, calcium, etc., that's going to stimulate PGC1-alpha, which is going to have several downstream effects. One of the effects it's going to have is it's going to increase oxidative phosphorylation subunits to help maximize the electron transport chain function. It's also going to downstream signal a transcription factor called TFAM, which is going to replicate mitochondrial DNA and cause mitochondrial biogenesis. It's also going to upregulate NRF1 and NRF2, and we'll talk about those in detail during the mitochondrial redox series, but these are the body's main antioxidant response elements, which upregulate a host of proteins that are responsible for 
helping to regulate reactive oxygen species and prevent oxidative stress from damaging cells. So as I alluded to, PGC1 alpha is influenced by a host of cellular factors. As you can see here, we've talked about kinase, we've talked about CERT1, but as you can see, there are a whole host of things that can influence both positive and negatively PGC1 alpha. And then PGC1 alpha, when it's actually activated, we've talked about how it helps with the mitochondrial biogenesis process and increasing mitochondrial electron transport chain subunits to help maximize mitochondrial function through the electron transport chain. But it's also important for, as we talked about, NRF1, NRF2, that's going to increase a whole host of antioxidant response genes and gene products such as superoxide mutase, catalase, and glutathione, as well as several others. TFEB is also an important protein product that helps with the activation of autophagy and mitophagy. And then it's going to help quelch neuroinflammation through PPAR and as well as preventing neuroapoptosis or programmed cell death of neurons, which can lead to neuropathology and neurodegeneration. As you can see, PGC1-alpha is an incredibly important mitochondrial factor to maximize mitochondrial health. So this is a, another slide that is showing the diverse actions of PGC1-alpha. And when PGC1-alpha activates in the nucleus, you see that TFAM is going to help regulate the mitochondrial DNA to replicate and create new mitochondria which is then going to go through the fission fusion mitochondrial life cycle. And then PGC1 alpha is also going to increase all of the powerful antioxidant enzymes that are responsible for regulating excessive reactive oxygen species. As you can see here, it's also going to have a direct effect on glutathione and it's going to help lower inflammation as a whole. So let's switch gears here and talk about how mitochondrial biogenesis and PGC1 alpha is related to cancer. So one of the most dangerous things about cancer is that it starts to systematically rely further and further on the Warburg metabolism or aerobic glycolysis. We've talked about this in detail over several videos during the Cancers and Metabolic Disease series. However, we're going to see another aspect of this story play out through PGC1-alpha, and it's going to have several of the same players as prior videos. So hypoxia or pseudo-hypoxia is going to act through HIF-1-alpha, and that is going to inhibit PGC1-alpha, and that's going to have an important role at progressing the reliance on glycolysis and the Warburg effect, because as we talked about in the last couple of videos, excess HIF-1 stabilization is going to lead to excess mitophagy, which means that the mitochondria, even healthy one, are going to be recycled. And then in addition to that, it's going to block our body's ability to produce new mitochondria to replace those. So as you can see, it's a double whammy of mitochondrial downregulation through the increased destruction of mitochondria and the inhibition of making new mitochondria. As you can see, as PGC1 levels lower, the, in this case, the renal cell carcinoma has less and less mitochondria and becomes more chemo and radio resistant. And what it's saying here is that long believed to be a byproduct of malignant transformation, reprogramming of cellular metabolism, aka the Warburg effect, is now recognized as a driving force in tumor genesis. In clear cell renal cell carcinoma, frequent activation of HIF signaling induces a metabolic switch that promotes tumor genesis. We know about this. We've talked about this in detail. However, here we demonstrate that PGC1 alpha, a central regulator of energy metabolism, is suppressed in VHL deficient CC RCC by HIF1 DEC1 dependent mechanism. And this is showing that HIF1 is acting through this DEC1 to block PGC1 alpha activation and mobilization so that mitochondrial biogenesis cannot happen. I think this is an interesting point that they found that when PGC1 alpha expression in this particular cell type, VHL deficient cells, restores mitochondrial function and induces oxidative stress, which exhibit impaired tumor growth and enhanced sensitivity to cytotoxic therapies. So this is one of those times when, although under normal circumstances, increasing PGC1 alpha will increase the antioxidant response and help quelch or diminish excess reactive oxygen species, the body somehow is able to know that PGC1 PGC1 alpha is able to actually increase oxidative stress when it's expressed and actually make cancer cells more sensitive to oxidative stress and death via chemotherapy and radiation, which I think is extremely interesting. It also helps restore the normal energy metabolism of cells when it's expressed highly in some cancer cells. So in this paper, we continue on talking about PGC1 alpha in the context of cancer. And what it's saying is that as coordinators of energy demand and nutritional supplies, the PGC1 family of transcriptional co-activators regulates mitochondrial biogenesis 
pathogenesis to control the cellular bioenergetic state. Aside from maintaining normal and adapted cell physiology, recent studies indicate that PGC1 co-activators also serve important functions in cancer cells. In fact, by balancing mitochondrial energy production with demands for cell proliferation, these factors are involved in almost every step of tumor genesis. In review, we discuss the interplay between PGC1 co-activators and cancer pathogenesis, including tumor initiation, metastatic spread, and response to treatment. So similar to pretty much the entire mitochondrial dynamics micro series, we've talked about how certain mitochondrial dynamics, whether it be fusion versus fission, whether it be mitophagy and mitochondrial biogenesis, have important roles at maintaining health and preventing serious diseases. However, when we actually have a transformation and an initiation into cancer, the game does change to some degree and it becomes less black and white and much more gray. We've talked about that in the context of fusion and fission. We've talked about in the context of excess fission in a lot of cancer cells, the excess mitophagy that can be seen in cancer cells. And we can also see how certain cancer cells can utilize PGC1 alpha to their advantage. So when PGC1 alpha is activated, in this case by NAD through CERT1, it's going to help activate our body's antioxidant response and it's going to lower reactive oxygen species. And then that's going to help to destabilize HIF1 alpha, which is going to be driving the Warburg metabolism and cancer metabolism as a whole. In general, we could see that PGC1 alpha in the setting of cancer likely has at least to some degree a positive effect. However, we've seen this where PGC1 alpha is activated by several different upstream biochemical processes. It's important for, as we've talked about, mitochondrial biogenesis and the anti antioxidant response element, but it's also important. And we've kind of alluded to this in that one paper talking about insulin sensitivity, and that is it helps uptake glucose from the bloodstream, which is going to lower blood glucose and lower insulin levels and help potentially with improving a insulin sensitivity or diabetes situation. But in cancer, you could see how knowing the mechanisms of the Warburg effect and the reliance of glucose and glutamine on cancer cells, how that could be potentially problematic. And indeed, that's exactly what this particular graphic is talking about. It's talking about how when PGC1 alpha is utilized and activated, it is going to, in some part, increase glycolysis, which, as you can see here, when PGC1 alpha in some tumors, you have a high amount of proliferation or growth because it's helping increase glycolysis machinery or enzymes to help utilize glucose more effectively. However, it's going to have an opposite effect on invasion and metastases. And as I've mentioned at least a couple of times since this series has started, generally it's invasion into other tissues and organs and metastases that actually kill patients. So again, we have to pick a side in some cases. We have to decide, are we going to set up a biochemical environment and a metabolic environment that favors fusion or fission, mitophagy or no mitophagy, biogenesis or no biogenesis. And you can see that there are pros and cons to each of those in each of the videos that we've lined out. We can see that accelerating glucose utilization in cells and increasing proliferation, it's not exactly a great strategy, but it also blocks invasion and metastases, which we know is a important cause of death in cancer patients. So we can see that there's pros and cons in this particular situation. And then when PGC1 alpha is low, you see a lower amount of proliferation, but a high amount of invasion and metastases. So obviously we don't want high amounts of invasion and metastases, that would be not favorable either. So we can see that we're kind of at a crossroads about what to do. And this is just showing that in different types of cancer, PGC1 alpha has different effects. So in this case, interstitial epithelial colon cancers, it's going to help with increasing glucose metabolism through glycolysis, as well as lipogenesis, which is going to potentially lead to cancer growth. And breast cancer is going to help the increased utilization of glutamine, which we know is a major fuel source for cancer. As a matter of fact, they have a whole table of different types of cancer cells and the amount of PGC1 alpha expression in those particular cancers. And in some cancers, it's decreased. In some cancers, it's highly expressed. In some cancers, it's barely above baseline. I want to end back where we started, back during the last video on mitochondrial heteroplasmy. Because at that time, we had not explained mitophagy or mitochondrial biogenesis. And I think now we've laid the groundwork about, in particular, what those two important mitochondrial dynamics are and how they relate to the destruction of damaged old dysfunctional disease-promoting mitochondria through mitophagy and the creation of new vibrant mitochondria through mitochondrial biogenesis. And I hope that now when we look back at this particular graphic again, it's going to make a whole heck of a lot more sense. Remember, when we have a basal amount of mitophagy and we have a basal amount of biogenesis, we're going to favor the mutant mitochondria and we're going to increase mitochondrial 
mitochondrial heteroplasmy. When we have increased mitophagy and elevated amounts of biogenesis, we're going to highly favor the wild type healthy mitochondria, and that's going to lead to a reversal of mitochondrial heteroplasmy. When we have a basal recycling and low biogenesis, it's going to also favor the wild type. And when we have impaired, deficient, or frankly broken mitophagy systems, and we have any amount of demand on the system, we're going to favor the mutant mitochondria, and we're going to lead to increased mitochondrial heteroplasmy in that particular tissue. And as you can see, both of these systems are critically important. If you had to pick one, just because of when you have low demand and you have basal recycling, it seems like recycling in mitophagy is slightly more important, maybe like a 60-40 importance in terms of mitochondrial health, but both are critically important. And this is where the exciting part comes in because what we've talked about is the molecular mechanisms of a lot of these mitochondrial dynamics. But where it gets exciting is that now that we understand what these processes are and why they're important, we can then talk about practical tips and strategies to optimize and maximize these processes so that we can be in this state where we're highly favoring the wild type mitochondrial DNAs and we can decrease heteroplasmy to the lowest extent possible to maintain health for the maximum amount of time possible and avoid all these diseases that are associated with mitochondrial heteroplasmy. I hope this is exciting. I hope this is hopeful information. If you like this video, please like it. If you have folks in your life that need this information, that need to know about mitochondrial dynamics, that need to know about mitophagy and mitochondrial biogenesis and how that relates to heteroplasmy and the reversal of heteroplasmy to prevent and reverse diseases, please share this with people that you know and love. And if you haven't subscribed already, please do. We're a growing mitochondriac army here. And I look forward to additional videos with practical, actionable steps on how to exploit and optimize these processes to maximize your mitochondrial health. Until next time.